and welcome to Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga, and each week we invite you to send in your questions and we'll explore the fascinating story of the city of Mississauga together. On this week's episode, we are excited to welcome Professor Tom Urbaniuk as we explore the life and times of Hazel McCallion. Professor Urbaniuk is with Cape Breton University and he's a professor of political science and a director of Cape Breton University's Tompkins Institute. Tom is the author of five books, including Her Worship, Hazel McCallion and the Development of Mississauga. Tom is a past chair of the National Trust for Canada, the National Charity for Historic Places. He is a former chair of Mayor Hazel McCallion's Youth Advisory Committee and a, for a former board member with Heritage Mississauga and resident of the city of Mississauga. In addition to his work with Cape Breton University, Professor Urbaniuk is involved in numerous nonprofit organizations and is also an Administrative Justice of the Peace for the province of Nova Scotia. Again, this week's episode is part one of our interview with Tom Urbaniuk, and please join us next week for part two as we continue to explore the life and times of Hazel McCallion. So joining us this week on Ask a Historian is Tom Urbaniuk, Professor Tom Urbaniuk from Cape Breton University. And uh, uh, Tom, in 2009, you had uh, the, you, you were the first to really capture the story of, uh, of Mayor Hazel in her worship. Uh, a fantastic read. Highly recommend anyone watching this to, to pick up a copy of this. Available through our public library and uh, numerous other locations, you'll be able to find this book. And I did see it on Amazon even today. So uh, it's still still out there. So that was only 2009, and really an incredible look at, at uh, the life and times of Mayor Hazel, and particularly her connections to through the development years of the city of Mississauga. Not that the development ever stops, but certainly her impact on that. And, uh, one person, you know, in a, in a hard, hard time arguing it, you know, the most impactful person in the story of Mississauga arguably is, of course, Mayor Hazel. And later this week, celebrating her 100th birthday. And so uh, for an incredible milestone, but an incredible career, touching the life and times of, of Mississauga. So thank you, Tom, for, for joining us all the way from, uh, from Cape Breton. Thanks very much, Matthew. It's a pleasure. And thanks for the kind introduction. Wonderful. And uh, I mean, I guess as, as an introduction, what inspired you to write the book itself? Like before we jump into Hazel, how about how, how did the book come to be? Um, so I had uh, done my PhD in political science with local government as an area of specialization. And uh, for my doctoral thesis, I looked at uh, suburban mayoral leadership. And I was really interested in the, the question, the problem, how is it, the intellectual problem, how is it that despite most Canadian municipalities, most Canadian jurisdictions being in what we call a weak mayor system, in other words, mayors have very few formal powers uh, bestowed on them by provincial legislation, how is it that some mayors have managed to emerge as de facto strong mayors, as dominating characters in their communities? And of course, for that, uh, Hazel McCallion was an important area of focus and attention. And also pre-Hazel McCallion, the development of the Township of Toronto, the town of Mississauga, some of the characters that had come before Hazel McCallion. Uh, so I was really interested in how the geographical variables, how some of the economic variables, social variables, and personality variables created these de facto strong mayors. So after the PhD, after the thesis, uh, my supervisors had encouraged me to keep this research going. Uh, and in particular, to uh, continue to focus on uh, Hazel McCallion. Uh, they really saw material for, for a book there. Actually, it was surprising that so little had been written in book form about Hazel McCallion, about the modern politics of Mississauga, uh, about suburban Canada, and for that matter, even about local leadership in Canada. It's an understudied area. So um, for the next few years, uh, so 2005 was the, the end of the thesis, for the next few years, I just kept going, um, and that resulted in the book in 2009. Of course, not written in thesis form, that, uh, but I really just attempted to write it in a more narrative style, 
um, and to look at some details that would not have been of much interest in an academic thesis. I, I'd have to compliment, to be honest, it, 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 a very readable book, uh, a really enjoyable reader. Your, your narrative and and your some of the anecdotes you put in and the way you intersperse some of her own quotes into it, just, it really is a readable book. Uh, this is this is a book for everyone. It's a book I, I, I'd highly encourage, particularly the residents of the city of Mississauga, not only for the life and times of Hazel, which are covered in here, but that, that the evolution of the place that we call home. Uh, incredibly well captured and uh, and uh, enjoyably so, in, in my opinion. <laughs> a small side note there. So after the thesis, I um, just wanted to focus on um, narrative writing. And uh, one of the books I read was uh, Pierre Burton's The Joy of Writing. Um, and it just it reinforced to me you know, the importance of sometimes looking for those small details, um, the appearance of a place, uh, the weather at a certain time, uh, the landscapes, uh, really to draw those pictures for, for, for the readers, to put them in that place or put them in that room with that person. Yes. And, and sorry, this was not a planned a part of our conversation by any stretch, but uh, I also have read uh, Pierre Burton and, and the thing that I took most away from it, and, I, and I'd echo your thoughts, but is a way to engage with the, the reader to find a place of commonality that they will care about the story and find themselves pulled into the story. And uh, you have done that. Uh, Pierre Burton, one of my favorites in doing that um, in terms of uh, taking uh, any subject and, and bringing it home to the heart of the person who's reading it. And, and uh, uh, but again, uh, from just- Something else I learned along yeah. the way too, which um, I really found helpful um, is, uh, so Francis Parkman, famous sort of 19th century uh, narrative uh, historian, American. Uh, and he would often say that he would not write about a, a place without going there. Um, and even if he was visiting the place a hundred or more years after the events that he wanted to write about, it was mandatory for him to go there. Uh, and so, for example, it became crucial for me to go to uh, Port Daniel Gascon, where Hazel McCallion had uh, spent her childhood, um, and even to be there when uh, many members of her extended family were gathering for a reunion. Um, and not to take detailed notes, not to violate anybody's privacy, but just to sort of get the spirit of the place um, and to be able to, to describe it and then to reflect on how that might have shaped the person Hazel McCallion was and the people around her too. So perhaps, I mean, Tom, you couldn't have given me a better segue uh, to, to, to kind of starting to explore, explore Hazel. The, 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 the ro most people who interact with Hazel in our city today or have, have connected with her know her as, you know, the mayor of Mississauga and perhaps even the former mayor of Streetsville. But that path from being born on the Gas Bay, um, you know, miles and miles away and a world away from Mississauga or what would become Mississauga, can you walk us through, uh, even briefly, that, that journey that Hazel was on uh, that would bring her to Mississauga, um, from her early years to, uh, to uh, residing in Streetsville? And just, can, can you walk us through kind of the, that early path that Hazel took? Yeah, and Hazel McCallion, or Hazel Journal, as she was previously, described herself as, as a country girl. And that was a reference to, uh, to Port Danielle. Uh, her family were involved in the fisheries. Uh, they were uh, very entrepreneurial. They were part of the Anglophone community of uh, Port Daniel Gascon. Uh, Hazel Journal herself was not really a fluent French speaker. Family who remain not there now, of course, are uh, fluent French speakers and integrated into the, the Francophone community. They were uh, uh, Anglicans, Protestants. Uh, they uh, were descended from the, uh, the French Huguenots, the, the Protestants uh, who, who settled in the Gas Bay. Um, and Hazel Journeau, Hazel McCallion, credited her uh, healthy lifestyle as uh, a young person. The fact that actually there were no food shortages, that the meals were healthy, that the uh, even if the climate was considered healthy in that part of Canada, 
Uh, she credited that for her strong constitution as an elderly person, as, as an elderly leader. Uh, she was uh, helping the family business with the books uh, from a very early age. Uh, and then sort of quickly was forced to become quite independent. There was no high school in Port Daniel. She went to Commissioner's High School in Quebec City and then to Secretarial College on the site of what's now Dawson College in Montreal. Uh, quickly got uh, some uh, jobs that might have otherwise not been available to her had it not been for the, the war years. And then, of course, with Canadian Kellogg, the engineering firm uh, was quickly given managerial responsibility uh, and then pulled uh, to initially to Toronto. And from there, sort of began, began her uh, sort of march to leadership in, in Ontario. Very, very crucial. And it's not talked about that much in uh, journalistic reflections on Hazel Journal, Hazel Medallion was the role that the Anglican Young Girls Association played in her development as a leader. The couple with whom she was staying in Toronto, uh, although members of the United Church, encouraged Hazel to join the AYPA uh, at the local parish, uh, where, by the way, there was a very dynamic young minister who had quite an influence on the development of Hazel Juno as a young adult. So as she rose to the ranks of the AYPA and became the, the national president, even traveling to Oslo, Norway for the World Congress of Christian Youth. Uh, that was an initial trip by air in 1947 that whetted her appetite for traveling, which remains to this day. Um, and it really sort of um, started to develop Hazel as as uh, sort of this energetic, uh, no nonsense, very present, very visible leader. Uh, not too immersed in the theology of the church, in sort of the intellectual and policy debates at that time, uh, more of a project person, uh, more of a kind of motivational person, very pragmatic philosophically. And those uh, features remained, I think, throughout her political career, her leadership career. And, and obviously, too, her, you, you, you mentioned, but that, that role in Kellogg's that was evolving very quickly into a managerial position, obviously, people within that organization saw some attributes uh, to, to uh, help steer their ship. Um, so those have to play a role, too, in that early development of Hazel. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it she had many hurdles and obstacles to overcome as uh, a young woman in a managerial function. Uh, but the fact that the war was on and it was all hands on deck and many positions that were not previously available to women were uh, certainly was an advantage in her development. Yeah. Did, um, at what point did uh, she come to, to Streetsville? When did her life journey bring her into the realm of Mississauga? It was 1951, uh, and it was shortly after Hazel Journeau married Sam McCallion, a, a photographer uh, from Mount Dennis, uh, residing not too far from where Hazel was residing in, in, uh, in Toronto. And uh, basically they were looking for just a place to put down roots, uh, a place in the country. Family members thought it was a little too far out. Uh, and, uh, but they found uh, a, a five acre property on the outskirts of Streetsville. So at that time it was part of the, the township of Toronto, but Streetsville was town for them. And so it was in Streetsville that they quickly developed a couple of businesses, uh, elite cleaners, Unique printing were uh, early businesses. They became involved in the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and because they owned property in Streetsville, that of course entitled them to vote in Streetsville. And that was very, very important. Did they, I, I've always wondered this, and I apologize if I've missed it and, and it's not a reference I've, I've connected. When they came, they bought the property just outside of Streetsville. Did they build their own house or was their house already there? Do you know? No, oh, there was not a house yeah. there. Um, yeah, so there was a, they built sort of a bungalow on that property, and that was part of the package. Yep. 
Oh, wonderful. Uh, and, and of course, I mean, they did have, uh, we don't need to explore, but they did have children and they raised a family in Streetsville and, and, and the like. Um, did her, did her business entry, did her business interests, interests, uh, then concentrate on Streetsville or did she continue associations to, uh, say Kellogg's and, and the like elsewhere? Yes, she was still working for Kellogg, often commuting to Toronto, but in parallel, the, the couple was forming these, these businesses. Um, and so by 1963, the Streetsville Booster newspaper was started by the McCallions, yeah. uh, with Hazel McCallion sort of listed from day one as editor and business manager, and Sam as the publisher. Right. And initially, uh, actually, it was a successor to a newsletter that they were putting out called the Streetsville Plaza News. But in 63, they started the booster as a monthly, uh, just boost. Uh, that was the uh, stated purpose, to boost the local businesses of, of Streetsville. Before long, though, the booster started to become very political. Uh, and it became a platform for Hazel McCallion's commentary on what she saw as the inadequacies of governance in Streetsville. And that was very, very important for the launch of her political career. At, at the time, like it, it's hard to go back in time and you might have the insight having having known Hazel and, and worked with Hazel and the book that you've, you've obviously written. But I wonder at what point did the idea of political aspirations uh, enter the mindset? I, I, I know the years, or I've referenced the years of, of the commentary in the booster, but wondering at what point the path was charted in, in a sense, did you have an insight as to kind of when the, the inkling to enter politics uh, came along? Actually, fairly early. So in the 1940s already, um, Hazel was involved with the Conservative Riding Association. Uh, this is when she was living in, in Toronto. Um, as I think even then, uh, there would have been just uh, some thought given to actually being in public office herself at, at some point. Uh, in Streetsville, uh, initially sort of any political ambitions were put on pause, but you have these businesses forming, you have the newspaper that's becoming more and more political in its commentary, you have Hazel becoming president of the Streetsville and District Chamber of Commerce, uh, which inevitably is involved in public affairs, is commenting on public affairs. And then in 1963, she's already on the Streetsville Planning Board and is soon chair of the Streetsville Planning Board. In 1965, many people don't realize this, in 1965, Hazel McCallion ran for Deputy Reeve of Streetsville and lost. Um, but undaunted, you know, the booster became even more strident in its critique of the, the council. Uh, and uh, Hazel remained active with the planning board and used that as a bit of a platform to really go after the mayor of Streetsville at that time, uh, Bill Fulton. Um, even though Bill Fulton was quite a progressive character, uh, he was building the new Streetsville Public Library, um, the council was uh, intent on preserving in fact, some of the key landmarks of Streetsville, including the old town hall um, or the Kinsman Senior Citizen Center as it later became. Uh, but Hazel was critical of that council, especially the one led by Bill Tolton. And she used the booster to promote an alternative. Her main ally on that council was uh, Jack Graham, who later became mayor of Streetsville, who had a severe follow falling out. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, politics, I guess, and you know that old adage makes strange bedfellows at times too. But you know, fr friends are 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 kept close, and and it's hard to cultivate those and keep those over time, particularly as. Plannings change, plans change as council evolves, as community evolves and whatnot. So it, it's hard, but you know, you, you still, all these years later, I mean, that, that uh, although Bill Tolton and, and now uh, Jack Graham have, have passed on, I remember speaking with them over time and, you know, they reflected that there was, there were challenges when they look back at their own career in that transition into Hazel, but at the same time, a lot of mutual respect. Um, and, uh, 
I, I know that we're we're not interviewing them and talking about them and their their time as well. But uh, interesting transitions in Streetsville, of course, uh, always hard. I think even today for someone who isn't embedded in that community to to come to represent that community. Um, and you know, here was Hazel, uh, not only an outsider uh, at first, um, but also a woman in what was largely a male dominated world of politics. You know, coming in in a very short order in hindsight, uh, developing businesses, developing that connection to the municipality, uh, but then also running for office and eventually succeeding uh, in, in office and becoming, not only succeeding, but really becoming that voice of Streetsville during amalgamation. Right, so 1967, Hazel ran again for Deputy Reeve and this time won. Uh, and within six months, she was Reeve. Reeve at that time was the title for deputy mayor of Streetsville. So they had a mayor, a Reeve, and a deputy. She ran for deputy Reeve. Um, the gentleman, Don Houston, who was elected Reeve, uh, lasted just six months. Uh, he, his work got really busy for him. He quit after six months. So Hazel went from being deputy Reeve uh, to, to Reeve. Uh, Graham was, was mayor at that time. This is 1968-69, Reeve of, of Streetsville. Streetsville had changed a lot. Uh, so we kind of look back and say, well, there's sort of small town, still rural Streetsville. I mean, not quite. It certainly had that sense of community. It certainly was conscious of its small town roots. But Streetsville had grown a lot. Uh, in the 1940s, Streetsville had 700, 800 people. By the late 1960s, it had 7,000. So Streetsville was a community of newcomers, it had a large Portuguese speaking minority. Uh, it had a lot of people who were employed in middle class professions in Toronto. Uh, and it had a lot of people who were very interested in civic engagement. So uh, Streetsville was sort of run as almost like a collaborative enterprise where you had this plethora of boards and committees, commissions, different citizens on them. Um, everybody's sort of aware of the big planning issues in town because even though the town had grown tenfold, it was still a compact whole. So there was a real sort of sense of civic awareness in, in Streetsville. And Hazel realized that. So her time in politics in Streetsville was a very progressive time. Um, she endorsed policies that placed on developers, things like uh, restrictions, uh, parkland and pathway development. There was uh, an environment, an active environmental group in Streetsville at that time already, and that was being encouraged by the town council. Better recreational opportunities, um, downtown revitalization led by university students. This is something that she encouraged and that the progressive politicians of Streetsville encouraged. And then of course, fierce opposition. Any talk of amalgamation with what was then known as the town of Mississauga. That's actually one of the issues on which Hazel and Jack Graham parted. Jack Graham was sympathetic to the idea of merging with Mississauga. Yeah. And, and I know that 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 fight against uh, you you one of your other books and I don't have it in front of me to hold up I'm sorry but uh, uh, farewell town of Streetsville and the story of amalgamation and uh, again uh, a fascinating story of a particular moment in our city's history that you know helps to define this this uh, this idea of city, uh, Mississauga growing from you know the outside in uh, so to speak and and these nodes these villages that help make up the identity of our city and of course Streetsville is is right in the middle of that. I do recall a countersuit at one point during amalgamation. Uh, I believe it was in 1973, where uh, mid 1973, uh, Streetsville countersued the province for amalgamation of part of Mississauga into a greater Streetsville. Uh, that <laughs> right. So actually, this possibility of amalgamation was on the table for more than a decade before it happened. There were a number of provincial reports that were commissioned. Already in the late 1960s, the Minister of Municipal Affairs for Ontario was uh, very much in favor of mergers and didn't have a lot of time for the idea of Streetsville remaining its own municipality. Uh, Streetsville 
opposed and under Hazel McCallion, it's certainly strongly opposed the amalgamation with town of Mississauga as the township of Toronto was called since 1968. Uh, on the grounds that in the perception of the citizens of Streetsville, Mississauga was dominated by developers, uh, fast buck developers as they call them. Uh, and in particular, three major companies known as the big three. So there was a sense in Streetsville that if we go in with Mississauga, we're just going to be overwhelmed by private developers who are not under any kind of control by elected people. Uh, and so Streetsville proposed, as you correctly mentioned, uh, and already if you're uh, in 1970, Streetsville was proposed, that it could uh, absorb it could uh, incorporate 9,000 acres of land around it, which were still largely undeveloped, uh, which is sort of where a large chunk of Aaron Mills and Meadowvale eventually went. But that could be part of an expanded town of Streetsville. And then these progressive leaders of Streetsville would keep tabs on the developers. They agreed that that land would be developed in some way, but they argued that if it fell under Streetsville rather than some kind of uh, merged city of Mississauga that the developers could be uh, better controlled. So Streetsville uh, actually made a formal application to the Ontario Municipal Board to absorb uh, 9,000 acres of surrounding land. And, and I think important to our, our conversation here today and to, to understand kind of that evolution, you know, here is Hazel McCallion uh, at that point wearing a different hat, the mayor of Streetsville. Uh, leading the charge against uh, amalgamation into the town or what would be the city of, of Mississauga. There's a little bit of that uh, kind of smile when you uh, the question is who amalgamated who at the end, but we'll come back to that in, in, a, in a little bit. I think uh, Streetsville uh, did not go quietly in the night as the saying would go. And uh, of course, Hazel, a few years after amalgamation, rises to the fore again with the city of Mississauga. I wanted to make sure that I touched on one thing here and uh, made reference to Hazel as a, as a woman entering what was dominantly a, a male field of politics. What uh, what kind of inspirations might have uh, helped chart that path for her? Are, are there are there uh, key figures that uh, helped pave the way for for Hazel? Uh, well, yes, uh, and Hazel herself has mentioned uh, Charlotte Witt, uh, so the first woman to be mayor of a major Canadian city, uh, Ottawa in the 1950s. So Hazel was very much aware of uh, Charlotte Witten's career. Uh, there was another sort of graduate of Streetsville uh, named True Davidson. Uh, so True Davidson had been the clerk treasurer of the village of Streetsville, it was in the 1940s. Uh, and then she moved to uh, East, what became East York and became the mayor of East York or as the Globe and Mail once called her, the ruler of all East York. Um, and actually there's, I came across a photo once uh, in my research uh, showing Hazel McCallion, the mayor of Streetsville, visiting True Davidson, who was no longer at that point mayor of East York uh, in 1971 to celebrate True Davidson's 70th birthday. Okay. Um, so there's another sort of connection, sort of a strong, Kind of uh, um, no nonsense, very managerial uh, woman political leader, um, and then in in later years, uh, Hazel McCallion would cite uh, Margaret Thatcher as an inspiration for her. Uh, so she certainly did have uh, role models. Uh, Mary Fix in the township of Toronto. So in the 1950s, Mary Fix was the Reeve of the Township of Toronto uh, and took on the old guard of the, the township, uh, really tried to bring the township into a more uh, professional administration and to gain some control over the developers who were already um, building at a fast pace without a lot of controls in, in the Township of Toronto. Uh, but Mary Fix, unfortunately, um, had her political career cut short in 1959, because the old guard was sort of able to reorganize itself and in coalition with some of the big development companies uh, was able to mount a campaign against Mary Fix. 
but she was certainly well known to Hazel McCallion. And uh, Hazel McCallion also took some lessons of, from Mary Fix's defeat at that time. I, I was, you know, we have the, the luxury of hindsight, and I'm not sure that we can put uh, Hazel's perspectives into the luxury that we have looking back in time. But you see a kind of a ebb and flow moment in time where you go from Mary Fix to Bob Speck, and of course Chick Murray for a short period of time, and then kind of that counter push back by the first mayor of the city and, and uh, uh, Dr. Dobkin, and then kind of that push back again from the old guard of Ron Searle, and then in sweeps Hazel. Uh, and and uh, maybe maybe I'm simplifying it a bit, but uh, you, you write a little bit about the the, uh, the leadership vacuum, presumably following the passing of, of Bob Speck. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, following amalgamation, and maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but, you know, following amalgamation uh, that comes to be in, in January of 74 to create the city of Mississauga, uh, Hazel is now a councillor uh, for the city of Mississauga, for Streetsville, but within four years rises to become the mayor of the city of Mississauga um, uh, at the time, our, our, our third mayor of the, of the, of the city. Um, but uh, those transition years uh, from losing the amalgamation fight, if you will, to eventually reigning the, t taking the helm of the city of Mississauga, what were those years like for Hazel, if you can kind of sum those up? Those were tumultuous years. 1974 to 78. One former reporter told me it was like big city politics. It really was. So factions on council, polarization, uh, a debate about the soul of the city. Uh, are we uh, going to sort of develop fast uh, or are we going to sort of develop a sort of a, a green neighborhood oriented uh, type of community? Uh, and Yes, uh, Hazel McCallion got elected uh, to the 1974 to 76 council as one of the reformers. She backed the young neophyte mayor, Martin Dobkins, 31 years old. He came from nowhere practically and won election as the first mayor of the city of Mississauga uh, because he successfully took on the old guard. Uh, he would basically go around during the campaign saying to Chick Murray, how much is blank, you fill in the blank, develop or pay you. Um, and the more sophisticated Chick Murray's campaign be became, the more it lent credibility to Martin Dobkin's message that there must be some money behind all of this. He ran a $4,000 campaign paid for from his own money and won that election. Um, and then there there followed just really a chaotic time. Uh, so most of the senior staff, of what had been the town of Mississauga, now the city of Mississauga, uh, resigned. Um, the, there was, the, the new council moved to sort of secure public property along the waterfront, very controversial in many instances. They moved to start developing a new official plan with tight controls over the development companies, very controversial as well. And in 1975, Dobkin, with Hazel's support, announced the judicial inquiry, council initially approved it, to look into allegations of malfeasance involving the former administration of the town of Mississauga. Um, and of course, the old guard tried everything to stop that and eventually succeeded in the courts on the basis that one city administration or one municipal administration, namely the city of Mississauga, could not investigate another city administration or municipal administration, namely the town of Mississauga, as it had been before 1974, before the merger with Streetsville and Port Credit. Um, so this actually left a lot of people exhausted, this struggle between the reformers and the old guard. Dobkin slipped a little bit. By his own admission at the time, he wasn't sort of the socializing type. He didn't have maybe some of the, 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 the charm and the negotiating skill that being the mayor of a big city uh, will take, even if his instincts were in the right place, as Hazel McCallion would tell you for decades afterward. So he lasted one term, as many reformers do. Uh, Ron Searle, uh, was the second mayor of Mississauga, and he was portrayed by the reformers, chief among them, Hazel McCallion, who was the chair of the planning committee, which was a great platform to be the de facto leader of the opposition of the city. He was portrayed as being one of the old guard. 
Um, and he quickly lost some of his credibilities. He lasted one term. They had this situation where the old guard and the reformers were lying wounded. Uh, and that's the leadership vacuum to, to which you refer. But, and into that stepped Hazel McCallion, having learned a lot about politics along the way. So as mayor, she quickly established herself as neither reformist nor old guard, but tried to somehow straddle those two with a populist style of leadership. What, what, in your view, what was it that opened the door for Hazel from that first run at being mayor of the city? Because she was she was up against you know the incumbent, and and. and what propelled her to the front? We, we alluded earlier that kind of that personality, the, the, the captivating element. She's always had that ability to, to speak and to get the crowd going kind of thing, that populist uh, type of um, movement. But what do you think uh, um, propelled her to having success in 1978? She decided to run in that election saying, either you go up or go out. That was her philosophy at, at that point. Um, she was the most prominent member of, of city council, um, so she was sort of the obvious opponent, Ron Searle, at that point. Um, and Searle committed some gaffes during the, the campaign. Uh, he had a sort of bland slogan, a, a good mayor, and Hazel McCallion then ran on the slogan, a better mayor. Um, <laughs> And in some of the debates, uh, and there were, say, of all candidates debates, quite a number of them in that election, um, Hazel McCallion just really bested Ron Searle. Uh, so now, sort of elected in 1978, she did move pretty quickly to consolidate uh, her, her authority. There was a major restructuring of the city committees. Interestingly, fewer citizens on the city committee after 1978. It's not something she would have tried in Streetsville. Streetsville had that long tradition of uh, civic engagement and expectation on the part of the middle-class progressives who were the powerhouse in Streetsville that that community would be governed as a partnership. In Mississauga, there wasn't, well, there weren't too many long traditions because you had this, um, this entity, somewhat artificial by Hazel McCallion's own state, with an artificial heart, as she called it, a city center, still largely on the books, not springing from a traditional downtown, a, a sense of civic identity, still very much in formation. So it was a little bit easier than it otherwise might have been to do that restructuring of the uh, the governance, the committees, who's on them, the extent to which citizens are directly involved, non-elected citizens are directly involved in the governance of the city, or even the city staff. So she didn't inherit a staff uh, that had been in senior positions for the past 20 years. That often gives administrators, bureaucrats, a leg up over politicians. And instead, the staff were quickly put on notice when a special committee was formed to look for savings everywhere and report directly to the mayor and council. Um, so very quickly, she sort of established a preeminent role in the internal governance of the city. Um, of course, the start of another official planning process um, where McCallion quickly signaled that, again, she would be sort of neither for the ideas of the reformists nor the pro-development or pro-developer old guard, that there would be something in between that would be um, eventually established. We'll maybe talk about that later. Uh, but I can't ignore that first term without mentioning the, the train derailment, 1979. That really put Hazel McCallion on the international map was not the formal head of the Emergency Response Committee. Uh, that was uh, actually Minister McMurtry, responsible for emergency management at the time. But of course, the public saw Hazel and she made sure of it too. Uh, there was an interesting story around um, the emergency control group being in a trailer uh, and making those hour by hour decisions. Uh, and then looking around and realizing that the mayor wasn't there. 
uh, because the mayor had already stepped out to address the media, right? And she per she justified that shamelessly. She said, uh, "My people, my people expect to hear from their leader." And so it was already sort of almost like a sense of personal relationship with the public of Mississauga. And not none of the other people in the room, the men in the room, were not, in her view, qualified to do that because they didn't have that relationship with the appeals in terms of evacuating, uh, in terms of mutual aid, they had to be made by the mayor. And the world saw that. Uh, and when all of this happened without loss of life, uh, it came to be seen as a, a tribute to effective leadership. And the paradigm of Hazel McCallion was born. Sense that the city had a competent and stable leader. And even if over the years things happened that might have called into question that image to some extent, a paradigm survived. And, and without a strong opposition, without a strong local media to develop a contrary narrative, that paradigm survived for almost the entire political career of, of Hazel McKellen. The event trained around him. I was going to say, I was going to say, I think you've answered the question I'm about to ask, but, you know, without the train derailment, do we have uh, a mayor that, uh, you know, is mayor for 30 years, 13 terms? Uh, do we, do we, uh, d does, does she face more opposition um, without the train derailment, so to speak? Yes, uh, I think Hazel McCallion would have been a formidable politician, a formidable figure without the train derailment, but that was the event early in her mayoralty. Remember that in the 1980 election, this is just after one term, she was acclaimed already. There was no opponent in the 1980 election. Um, so, so general was the consensus that the derailment was handled effectively by the city. Having just, uh, uh, you know, it, it feels like years ago now with what we've been going through the last uh, uh, almost year now with COVID, but, um, uh, having just come off the, the, the anniversary of the train derailment, the 40th anniversary, and uh, having had a chance to go through all those historic newspapers from 1979, that, you know, daily, whether it be the Toronto Star, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Mississauga Times, the Mississauga News, uh, I mean, Roy McMurtry was the head, and of course there was the, you know, the, the police chief uh, for the emergency response control uh, plan, and the fire chief for the on-site control. I mean, they're all the ones making those major decisions associated with the emergency plan. Um, but the face you see on the newspaper, on every single newspaper, is Hazel. <laughs> and uh, that, to go back to what you're saying, that cements the image uh, of, of this capable and in control uh, leader of the people. Right, and she would justify that, saying that communication is key to any crisis. Uh, you need a consistent message, you need a consistent uh, messenger. Um, you need clarity. Uh, you don't want to contradictory messages from uh, you know, random officials. Um, so she would say that's part of the best practice of effective emergency management. I was going to say, in a way, she set the standard, I think, for, for subsequent emergencies as well. But again, what role a politician can play um, in communication. Um, I don't know if we've seen it like necessarily, but that seems to have been something that w was done very effectively in terms of the residents of Mississauga. When we, when we did a bunch of interviews on people's memories of the train derailment, the, one of the biggest things that came back was how effectively they were communicated with. They understood what was happening. There was nothing that they were aware of being hidden at the time. They were very up to date on what the process was and what the timelines were and, and, and that sort of thing. So you know, I guess th that strategy from Hazel's perspective was certainly effective. Right, right. Um, there was some good fortune too, let's acknowledge. Um, if, thank goodness this was a crisis that could be largely contained within the space of a week. Thank goodness the train derailed where did because there were major areas of population one kilometer on either side. Um, so it could have been much more tragic and much more difficult. As an emergency, to study emergency, as it goes from week to week, month to month, it becomes more difficult to for any leader to sustain the consistency of messaging or to sustain their own energy. Yes, no, I agree entirely. I can I 
constrained and confined emergency with a, a very short beginning and end date, I guess would be, if anybody had to paint one picture, that would be the ideal, right? Is, is that how do you amend it? Thank you for joining us on Ask a Historian. This week, we've had an opportunity to engage with Professor Tomer Banyak on the life and times of Hazel McCallion, and this has been part one of the interview. Join us next week for part two as we continue the story and the journey of Hazel McCallion in Mississauga from 1979 to the present. Thank you very much to Professor Tomer Banyak for sharing his passion and expertise, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank <laughs> you.